Hey everybody, this is Brad Dyke reaching out to you and just touching base on something that apparently has happened. As I'm evolving my Proxmox to the redesign phase, in other words, I know everything works. Yeah, but now I can begin the process of, like I said, think outside the box, take all the gear out, reformat format it, work with things that will work for what you've got, and try to evolve it into something new. But as I was trying to do that, something happened. And it was pretty significant, actually. My DX720, my Dell Edge Power, Power DX720 OEM chassis, this guy right here, has begun to encounter problems. And um, this worried me. So I had to very quickly turn around and start transitioning over to my other DX720 over there, which is a true NAS platform, just to back up the data to make sure I have it. And then I decided to work with this motherboard, which is starting to fail on me. And I went out and also got myself a brand new uh, Dell release motherboard, which is different than the one I've got over there. The one I have over there is an OEM motherboard by Google because, of course, this was OEM'd. And if you don't know what OEM means, OEM basically means a white box that is rebranded as somebody else's product but in truth, is made by you. Uh, the Isilon chassis, this guy right down here, he is actually a super micro chassis, and the Google search engines, the 360 platforms, and so on, they'll be manufacturers like a Dell chassis, like you see here. But my chassis is, is having issues, and this is a spectacular server, and I work it to death, and I'm not surprised I finally broke it. But today, you're going to see me swap out the logic boards plus... I am going to, on a single PCIe bus only, going to be putting in a 512 gig boot parrot set, uh, which will act as the boot drive for it, because I'm going to take it to a new level. Now, I usually do 50-50. I use Microsoft operating systems, and I use Linux operating systems, and I'm going to go ahead and transition this one up to 2022, so I can stay current on the operating environments, plus also have a very common user interface for all of the Microsoft-based systems in, in our home. So with that being said, all my Linux platforms interact with the TrueNAS platform, and of course the TrueNAS supports the Microsoft server. So with that, hang on for just a minute as we start this process. Now, as we start the process, you need to look at what we've got here. We have what's called a pull sleeve motherboard. In other words, if you look underneath it, this is the uh, SD card reader. If you look underneath it, it has what's called a slide tray. This is the interlocking slide tray that allows you to remove one motherboard and put the other one in. But you still have to do the process of prepping, configuration, and so on. So with that being the case, I'm also going to check these free CPUs that were given to me to see what kind of level of performance these CPUs are, if they might be slightly better. I'm not really caring because I do have some pretty powerful processors already. But hey, can't hurt, right? Anyways... Stand by. Okay, so what came with this motherboard is the Intel E5 64, I'm sorry, 24, sorry again, E5 2640 uh, processor stack, 6 core, 12 hyper thread based. Decent intro chip, no problems with that whatsoever in my book. I'm okay with that. Um, though I do have to free these processors up get them out so that I don't run the risk of um, having any issues with them and I will do that but uh, I wanted to identify the class chip that which I have on board currently and then review what I will see what I've got and if I got a free upgrade in the process of buying a hundred dollar motherboard what the heck right that's another hundred dollars uh, no objections there uh, you know when you work with countries across the sea they do their thing and, and all that good stuff, but uh, inevitably your goal is to uh, try to get the best prices possible without getting scammed. And that was one of my driving forces here. So, what we're going to do next is I'm going to prep the motherboard. So I'm prepping the motherboard. As you can see, I've already positioned and set unchecked all components. and made sure that the processor bays were clear. And I'll re-secure them because I don't want anything going to happen to these guys. Uh, some people will say, why are you exposing the pins? I say because it works a little bit more efficiently for me to be able to 
set and gri grip in these areas here and I just want to make sure that uh, if I have any problems whatsoever they're going to be very visible to this because I've got a 14 day window on this motherboard and I need to make sure that I've got it spec'd out correctly, tested and vetted before my support agreement ends. So now what you're going to see is I'm going to move the Dell, the Dell chassis over here and put it here and we'll see the extraction process. So stand by for a second. Okay, so we've got the Dell chassis here. And I apologize for the pausing off and on, but um, she's big. She's really big, actually. So you got to give her respect and make sure everything works right. And all the parts and pieces are there for what needs to happen. So as you can see here in this particular format, the way this is designed and the way I've got it populated is I have my bridge card, my fiber channels, I'm sorry, not fiber channel, my SAS controller interface for my external storage capacities. I have the air ducting control systems, which I'll remove. And I've got my base here with my processors and everything, my chips, my memory, all my subjugate interfaces, my paired interfaces, which are up here, uh, and basically everything I need for mounting and position. So with that being said, um, this particular model and configuration, and if you look way over here, is an external SSD reader, so I won't necessarily need to use an internal SSD reader, but that is pretty cool, isn't it? See, that's a RAID 1 SSD card configurator. Isn't that cool? Uh, or I would at least make it RAID 1, uh, either native or software-based. But basically, now I'm going to have to take all of this out and get it completely compartmentalized over there safely so it's not going to have any problems. It'll be on static anti-static electricity uh, mats and uh, basically make sure it never hurts to take a picture of what you got because if you don't pay attention, your interface and setups and so on could get kind of messed up and you don't want that to happen. So with this setup and platforming, we're going to be able to get that accomplished. So. Uh, the next stage is going to be to de depopulate this unit, move everything off, and get it to the point where I can remove the processor stacks and heat sinks and all that good stuff, memory and all of that, get that all out as well, and then clear it. So the next time you see the next stage of this, all of this gear will be removed. There is nothing really special about removing this equipment. Uh, the only thing that is special is that you use an anti-static matting to hold your electronics just to be safe all right so stand by here for a minute all right so what i'm going to do because i think some of you have said we would like to see not so much fast motion but actually some action items and as you can see here i'm in the process of doing that now i have what's called a grounding point here on and right in front of me that completely keeps me grounded so as i'm removing my external lsi sas card uh, i'm safe to make sure that i'm in good shape and over here, way over here on the far side, is where my stack mat is. And that's where I'm putting everything that I need to have in play. So with that, I'll go ahead and show you my next steps here. As I take my riser card sections out, those are not static sensitive. Now, one thing I will make note of this is if you look at these, look what they have. This is why this chassis is so awesome. This guy can do GPUs, multiple GPUs. Uh, granted, you have to be careful on your bus and all of that, but the point of value is that, wow, I didn't know I could do this. This is really awesome. Uh, this this uh, Dell chassis is just really phenomenal when it comes to um, getting everything you want from it, performance-wise. So, next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna extract the 10 gigabit onboard NIC, which is PQF set, which means that it's that part of it is sitting on the motherboard, soldered to the motherboard, while the daughter card interfaces are a part of it on the side. Now, the truth of the matter is just nothing more than a pathway, so it's not really PQF in my opinion, um, but any microchip that is soldered on a platform is basically um, a PQF the rest of this is the rest of the NTU, the network processing unit, its heat sinks and all of that for a 10 gig interface. Pretty cool actually. So, this right here is the housing set. 
underneath there is a, is a logic card that I will have to remove and then put into the new motherboard. And uh, with that being said, the next task is to free up and release the micro data card, which is right here. It is a small set, and there I've got my USB 3.0. Uh, works really well. Very easy to work with, very easy to manage. I can extract it and put it over here on the circuit card set, and then put this back together and set it aside as a component. Components go over there, static discharge environment is over here. As you can see, now I am starting to see more and more in my environment. And that's a good thing because I want to make sure that I'm in good shape. Now, this interface here is my internal SAS interface. And it is going to go to this stack controller. Let me pull that out. Give me a second here. A little bit tricky to get out, but once it gets free, it's good. So here's the con controller configuration for the onboard SAS. This is a basically in correlation with the perk controller that's built on these DX platforms. And I can secure that over there in static electricity shielding. And okay, that looks good. All right, now I am going to remove the fans. They are not going to do us any good. They have to come out. And you want to make sure that there are no secondary connectors on the underside before you pull out the actual fan chassis. Sometimes you'll have cables running through this, so always remove the fans first before you pull the chassis out. All right. Now you'll have to pull out all of the memory that you've got and all of your blanks as well. Now, what I recommend you to do at this stage, before you truly remove this, you want to write down on paper the placements of your units, okay? So, when you look here, I've got one free, two populated, one free, two popul three, uh, three, sorry, three, four populated, one free, two populated. And I've got the same kind of setup on the top side banks and the, and the lower base banks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to document that. That way I know that I am basically in a good place and that I can get everything back up the way I need it to be based on the set of memory modules. So here I've got two, blank and two, and then a blank. And I'll go ahead and finish this up and I'll resume this video once I've got that part done. Okay, so what we've done here is I want an extra step because of concerns that I have for the um, memory placement, which is very important, by the way. And this memory placement is in sequence. In other words, they're in order. So you have to pay attention to that placement uh, as you're basically removing the memory because it has to go back in the right order. Now, why do I say that? Because so few of us actually buy all of our memory up front and mount it to the motherboard, right? We usually inherit the memory. And in doing so, we also have old and mixed and future memory. And so what ends up happening is you have different kinds of memory, sizes and so on and speeds. But as long as you're putting them in pairs uh, that match exactly the same, the motherboard doesn't care. It basically, as long as they're consistently, basically the model and the function, uh, then it's going to be perfectly okay with them, even though they may not be an exact same match and brand. 
some in the industry would say, you know, everything should be the same. Others say, I'm too broke. I can only afford so much. So they will mix memory. In this case, I do that too. But one other key detail that I'm doing here is I've taken an extra step here. And what I've done, I'll take you over here and I'll show you. Over here I have sitting on my uh, chair is the new motherboard. And I totally discharged it, so it's perfectly safe sitting on this. And I've been putting the, transferring the memory directly over to make sure that I did not get the orders out of sync. So that's very important to do. So with that, I will put you back over here. And we will resume in just a second once I get the last memory over. Okay, so now we're ready to resume. We'll put our documentation away. So the next thing is to free and release all the rest of the cable sets. Disconnect all the interfaces so that we are in the clear. And uh, we'll get that done. And then I'm also going to go ahead and remove the CPUs. Now, a lot of times when I do this, I will clean the CPU crystalline clean, nice and, nice and neat and everything. Uh, and then put it all back together. I am going to do that partially, but I won't put that on display tonight because um, I am a little crunched for time because I have all the other projects I'm working on. But uh, I will definitely make sure that uh, I first fully identify the, the processor stacks because I want to compare chips with the new chips to make sure that I'm not getting the same thing, all right? And then uh, at that point in stage, I will then turn around and look at... Uh, making sure that heat sinks are nice and clean. This is uh, kind of goopy, but it's fresh goop. That's good news. I mean, that's that's the right kind of goop. You don't want to see dried or crusted, especially on these chassis because they get too warm, and they really do genuinely need to dissipate heat effectively. It's about moving heat more than just dealing with high temperature. Being able to offload it somewhere else allows you to convect that heat away from the core processor or any other microchip that it generates heat. That being the requirement. If it generates heat, then absolutely take the steps to uh, put a heat sink or something on it, like I ex uh, gave exhibit on one of my old uh, videos. So we're at the point now where the second processor is coming out. Again, I check and inspect the, the unit. It looks good. It's not too goopy. It's just about right. So that being done, I will now free the processors up and take them out of the equation. Now one side note, which you won't see in this video, is be very careful with the compounds you use. Um, wear gloves, keep your hands clean, wash your hands after working on this stuff. Make sure that you don't get any of the goop on you. It's not healthy, to say the least. So, um, now that we got the goop out of the equation, which is the key thing, we will go ahead and close this down and secure this motherboard. Okay, and then we're going to disconnect the rest of our interfaces, SAS cables, bridge cables, and all that good stuff. Now, there is something I did notice differently on this motherboard versus my new one. There is a cap on this one particular interface, and it goes up to the bridgeway here for the SAS interface. Make sure that when I show you on the new motherboard to remove the restrictor cap from that setup. Now, continue to disconnect everything to the point where it is free and clear. And get the SAS cable off. Okay. Come on off. That one's off. That one's off. 
Now I have another set of bus cables over here that we could get to remove and clear them as well, as well as the bridge daughter cards that uh, connect our edges right on here on the ends. Make sure you free them as well. Um, and extend the cables outside the chassis because you're going to have to pull back some of these so that you can clear them correctly. That's an important detail. So, all right, this one's free. And then that just leaves one last connection interface, which I will try to get now. It is a pain to get to, though. Come on out of there. Come on. What a pain. I really do not like how they hit this one connector back here. Every time I have to deal with it, it does not want to come out nice. Doesn't want to play easy. So, we're going to have to use a bridge cable. And a stick set tool. I can find one. Here we go. Small screwdriver just to get the restrictor clamp off. And then that should free up to lift the, con the connector off. And it's off. Okay. So, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to be releasing the locks on this motherboard. And I've, it usually takes a couple of tries to do this, but uh, I'll free these. And then that will allow me to drape the board back and lift the board out. It's literally that easy. Now, uh, give me just a second here. I'm going to pause the video because I have to do two things here first. But don't worry, I will show you the, the uh, removal process uh, of the motherboard itself so that you clearly know how that process will work. Um, now, at the same point in time, I'll also take out my giant, huge, dual, du this is called a double-edged double, double -edged Dell SAS connector. Get that guy out of the equation as well. And uh, do a couple more checks here, and I think I am good to go to pull this out. All right, stand by for just a minute. Okay, so we're ready. All the edges and sets are removed. Uh, checking just to make sure everything else is good to go. There is a screw right here, just one single screw. Remove that screw, which is right here. And you can then lift this button, this blue button right here, and slide it back, like that. So, with that being the case, I'm now able to remove the motherboard from the chassis. I want to be somewhat careful with it because even though this board might be failing on me, I might have to fall back to it just in case something doesn't work right. So make sure that you're clearing it correctly and that all your edges and everything are clear. Uh, the cables on the far left side can give you some grief, but um, just keep wiggling it till it frees itself up. And voila, it's out. It's big, isn't it? Really a big motherboard, but not difficult to put in, not difficult to take out. It's one of the better designs. I really, really, really do like this. This is going to go up on my wall somewhere someday. I'll put this guy over here. bring over the new motherboard. Now you're going to have kind of like a similar problem getting it in just like the other one. Make sure everything is clearing correctly and keep raising the cable edges so that they're not interfering with you lining up the motherboard. And trust me, some of these things are just such a royal hand of butt to align. Come on. One thing you also don't want to do is get it twisted in place. That can give you some you know, headaches going forward. Okay. Now make sure all your feed lines are cleared and that you are ready to correctly line everything up 
you may discover that some of your cables like that one right there is under the motherboard so you'll have to free and clear that oh pain i hope you go come on get out of there all right there you go that's better now the next task is to properly align it so that you can slide back into place and if you look very carefully right here your power edge for your dual power supply connector is direct to the motherboard so you have to make sure you align correctly when you're doing this because uh, the end result is you'll damage that power ed edge connector and uh, then this this is done we're all out of the out of the woods if you know what i mean now one thing you can also do to help the situation is to pull the power supplies out so you can better align everything and get them in the right place and then the little woman you will be able to, to lock it into its home. Make sure as you prepare to slide to sleeve this back into place that you have properly cleared the edges they will interfere with you being able to close this in and lock it into play. So, just as a heads up. Okay, come on. You can do this. Alright, let me reposition this and I'll be right back. Okay, now, to get this to lock, I won't lie to you, it was not easy. Uh, it did not like it. Um, that's okay. The easy fix is this. Putting your hand over here on the on the pull handle, which is just a little T-shaped handle, and being on this end, evenly putting pressure gently on the motherboard to make it flush each of the slide locks. Once they flush up correctly, it snaps right in. It just took a second. The next thing I knew, I was good to go. So now, minus the processors, I'm ready to start connecting things back up so that I can... Um, get to the point where I can test this chassis and make sure it's in good shape. So I'm going to do that now and start reconnecting all my interface cables as such and getting them into their proper homes. Okay, my SAS bridge is connected on that side. All secondary cables on the front are good. Now I've got a restrictor cap right here and uh, I'm gonna take it off here I need that for my external bus come on that was the problem there give me just a second while I check this out yeah it looks like it's there it goes. Okay. So this is a restrictor. It's designed to kind of make things look like they don't exist, but they do exist. And I do have a cable for it right here. So that's important for me because I can't function without that in some of my extended functions, as well as my extended SAS interface right here, which pairs up to that along with a couple of other interfaces that I need to have that are in good shape, specifically my power hookups. So remove them as you see fit and then properly start hooking up your equipment again on that side as well so um, the other pain in the rear end unfortunately but to require that I remove some memory to do this correctly so I can get to these connectors is to get the side bus edge connectors properly connected again so that's that's this guy right here if you can see that and there's a second one with it as well. You cannot see, but it's there. It's on the end, and you got to, yep, you got to connect it up. So that's kind of a pain in the butt, but it's just a fact of life. Uh, it was difficult to get to, and it was, di and it'll be difficult to put back on. But it does all the inter interface communication for the front of the motherboard. So it's required. Right, are you on there good? Yes, I think you are. 
Yep, you are. That's okay, good. And then I have this tiny little um, pseudo pan the butt edge connector that is just very difficult to work with because it's in such a bad place. But I guess they had to put it somewhere, alright? So this is where forceps come into the equation. So it does help you get everything in the right place when your fingers are too big. You know what I mean? So, obviously part of my challenge is making sure that the cable is not inhibited in any way so it can reach correctly. And that was a problem just for a second. I corrected that. Now I am in the process of realigning it and getting it in place. As much as I love this motherboard and all of its features, the integration of it being put together has some issues about it that are a pain in the butt, but it is what it is. So I just deal with it. If you know what I mean? Alright, you are just gonna fight me on this tooth and nail, aren't you? Yeah, but I won. Yay! So with that being done, put my forceps away. Continue to connect up the rest of my connectors. And now I can begin the process of adding the sub daughter cards, which, for instance, like the 10 gig NIC, it has to go into its home correctly. And it's kind of a tight fit, but it's not too difficult. You just have to get it to see correctly by putting your fingers as they point out and that will allow you to make a good solid push on the edge connector allowing us to put the 10 gigabit port back in play and get things working now it's not aligning very well so let me check this out and see what's going on here it looks like it's aligning Yeah, it just needed a little bit more maneuvering to clear it up and lock it in place. So, now we've got that in home. Next, we're going to put the RAID controller in. And I'll show you a really cool trick with this later. When I rebuild this and I bring my drives back online, believe it or not, I'm going to tell you this, it's true. I'm going to re-import my drives right back in so that I can resume using the disk configurations I have on my RAID card as I go forward. Now obviously make sure that you're putting the pressure points in the right places and that everything looks like it's secured and it's going to work. Alright, so with that being the case, next we're going to go ahead and put in the, put in the USB 3.0 card. I use that for special needs, as well as offloading data when necessary. Uh, you will find that many people, like myself, will put a USB 3.0 card in a chassis because they don't want to work with their 2.0 standard cards interfaces on the front end. But, unfortunately, it sucks. The reality of the fact is, um, you know, the NICs are not native which means you're not going to be able to use them um, in the boot process, but you can use them for data transfers. And that's okay with me, because the USB ports on this chassis do work at 2.0, and it's fairly decent. I mean, it's not bad. Yeah, I've, I've seen worse. Uh, so that is not going to be a problem for me. Not really. So with that, though, I do have the USB 3.0 on there for adding my ice dock. USB 3.0 uh, disk arrays so that I can have the margin of the level of performance that I need for fast transfers when I want to offload something to something else. Okay, that one was the last cable, I believe. Good, 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 good. 
double check, double check. Yes, that's good. Okay. The next component. Can we make sure that our alignments are right? Yes. Believe it or not, your fan chassis may not reinsert correctly due to cable uh, junction interfaces. You've got to make sure that they're right. If they're not, you're not going to be able. So I've got a problem right here. Um, you're not going to be able to close the case. And so when your cables get out of whack and they get in the way, uh, you don't want to force it in there. You got to get it up. You got to get these down below the mounting points. And that is imperative because you'll damage the cable interfaces if you don't. And I don't want to do that because these cables are not cheap. And they're kind of hard to find, but I got to back up if I have to. If you know what I mean. All right, so there we go. Now the CPU chassis fan is in there. And it looks good and snug. We will go ahead and populate the fan base. These are great fans, by the way. These fans are push and pull, dual fans. And they really do a real good job of not making a lot of noise. I know a lot of you guys complain about that, and I get it, but the reality of the fact is they, these are remarkably quiet. I'm very impressed with them in general. Okay, so what we're going to do here is I'm going to check these two riser sets to make sure they're correct, because I don't think they are. In fact, I'm positive or not. Okay. That's better. Now they should align correctly. Yes. All right, so I'm going to lock these down into play. And uh, since I've got my onboard, I'm good there. So my next challenge is, of course, to put my SAS card in. Get that mounted. Now, since this is my only SAS outbound versus my SAS inbound, I always keep the top slot free for a second SAS controller if I want to do paired uh, disk array testing and I don't want to mix and match, right? That's a, that can be a problem sometimes when you do that. So now I am going to go ahead and uh, plug up my power supplies to make sure they are in alignment. They are, so that is good. So the next thing I'm going to do, and this, I'm going to pause the video for this, is I am going to clean my processors, inspect them, Let's see if I've got a lesser or a greater quality quantity or quality processor than what I got with the motherboard, the 2640s. And uh, compare them and see if they are of any value. Um, and if not, I'll discard them. If they are, we will use them. So I'll be right back. I changed my mind. I decided that I will show this process. I only need to clean one processor. Because I put I dress these down pretty good and they're pretty wet, so that's good. So I'll, I'll just show you how this is done. Basically, I have an Arctic Clean, you know, bottle one and bottle two, and you basically will spray this about three drops, four drops max, on the processor, and it'll begin the process of loosening up the uh, compound, so it's easily be, it's easily removable, and then use the compound number two to basically remove the resin effect so that it's not going to cause any problems for future chemicals that you're going to put on, in this case, more thermal paste. Um, and, but you, you just put it on there and you loosen it up so you can get it to a good place. And make sure, again, wear gloves. Be very careful how you go about doing this. 
and always make sure that you completely dissipate any static discharges on your body when you're doing this and use static film like I'm using here to protect the processor. Okay, so I can now see the processor, but I'm not done. Now I'm going to use number two. Again, this is called Arctic Clean. Been using it for years. I have cleaned hundreds of processors and other types of stuff that has, uh, you know, thermal paste or other things that I could need to remove, like adhesives and compounds. Kind of like Goo Gone, but better. And yes, it does smell like oranges. So it's akin to uh, Goo Gone, I suspect. Okay. So now I can read this processor. I'll clean it some more. Get rid of the residuals. And there it is. Alright, so let me get my spectacles. And these are 2660s. So the processors that I have in there are not 6 core, but they're 8 core, uh, eight, uh, 8 core, 16 hyper thread based. So I'm going to stick with these processors, uh, opposed to downgrading to the 2640s. Actually, I've been contemplating the idea of um, basically maybe upgrading to even a higher processor stack. But you know what? These things have been working great. Their power consumption isn't really bad. Uh, the output is more than enough. I mean, how much do you really, truly need, right? Uh, you don't. Not for testing labs and stuff like that. But unfortunately, I have met some individuals out there that are like, more power, more power, more power. Right, Linus? Nothing bad about that. Just making an observation. <laughs> so, I'm going to go ahead and put these back in. And properly get them mounted. So I'll get this going. And remember, like I said, it's important that you wear gloves. Very important. And also, even when you wear gloves, take the time to clean the gloves as best you can because you really don't want to mess with this paste. It's not good. Not healthy. Okay, so once you've confirmed that your processor is correctly seated, which mine looks like to be, uh, then you can go ahead and prepare it for um, the lockdown. And uh, so that's good. Good. And you are good. So I will lock you down next. And now we're ready. Now, I have to put some paste on one of these processors because I cleaned it, right? So, I'm going to give it another quick buff. Now, when you use thermal paste, uh, you want to get something like MX4 or Arctic, or Arctic Paste or one of the Arctic class um, uh, thermal paste. You just want to create a small, not even a dime size, little mound of the stuff in the middle. Uh, and since I only use X4 anyways, I know that what I have on my heatsink is an X4 already, so I'm okay with that. So with that being the case, I can go ahead and put this in position. And um, there we go. And start the process of mounting it. And it's going to squish out like it's supposed to. And I put about four turns on each screw to evenly distribute the weight load. And that's four and four, so another four. All right, and just keep doing that till it locks in. And you can't turn it anymore. All right, that's good. And that's good. Okay, so heat sink is on. I'll put the second heat sink on. Get 
get that going. Three, four. One, two, three, four. 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 Eight. And this should be the last time. Yep. Okay. So now I've got this done. I have to do a couple more things. Uh, specifically, removing all of my hard disks now. This is going to be hard for me because <laughs> I always, 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 always have three, three sources of my data. That's just my enterprise world talking. But to remove my hard disks is kind of uh, heart jerking because obviously the concern lies in the fact that when you do that, you only have one backup. And how scary can that get? <laughs> Quite. But I'm also inserting the new NVMe drive. This is, uh, of course, it's always going to be a pain in the butt. But what is it? All right, so like I said, I always keep the open bay available when necessary. Now I can move this card down below to the other slot if I wanted to, or I could put it over here. Matter of fact, I like that idea. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna. The reason why I want to do that is because to have a SAS controller and an NVMe controller sitting on the same PCIe but bus is going to potentially cause some potential uh, some headaches right because they're going to have to share the same bus so if i choose to just keep one data bus on each then i'm going to give all the lion's share of the bandwidth to these two lanes and that's going to give me maximum return on performance very important now i don't know if this unit can boot off of in um, nvme we're not. That's an experiment. Obviously, I chose to do that while I'm doing this major swap out, but I'm not going to post anything or boot anything, so that won't matter. I'm going to first do my diagnostic loops, which is what you'll see next, and then we'll take it to that next level. So stand by for just a second. Okay, so now you have to do what we call the... <laughs> What I call the lid test. This is how you know your motherboards and your cables and everything are properly seated. If this lid does not just slide into place, then something's off. So I'm going to have to check, and I think I know what it is. I think it's this guy right here, my fan base, I think is the problem. So i got to bring it out. Yeah, I think I see the problem. These cables are creeping up getting in the way of the fan bus and uh, it's still not clearing correctly something is getting in the way hmm. Okay, so we'll depopulate the fan bus out of fans, and we're going to see where it's getting the resistance. On this side, it just wraps right in, but on this side, it's not. There it goes. All right, so let's put it back together. Again, the lid test always must be done, and whatever you do, don't cram and shove and shove and cram and force things into place, because if you do, you're going to break something. And, you know, it's not easy to repair these things or to source out the parts when they break. So i just bring that up to your attention. Now we're going to try the lid test again. Check and make sure everything is good. Looks like it is. All right. Here comes the lid. OK. 
Okay. Looks like it's latching correctly. Uh, let's move. Okay, yeah, it, it, it slid nice and neat. So we're ready. So our next mission is going to be the boot up process. And uh, give me a second here while I reposition and we'll take it from there. Hang on. All right, so we're attempting a post boot <laughs> with a very funny, very interesting jury rig. I call the VGA to splicer to HDMI coupler to HDMI cable. I have no idea if it will work, but hey, it's all I got right now. I had to upgrade my monitor, so uh, it doesn't have VGA output anymore like it used to. And um, so uh, I'm hoping that this will work. Uh, we will see in just a second. We should see a post here any minute. Maybe. I think what I'm going to do though is I'm first going to power off everything. All right, let's try this again. I pulled all my other hard drives out. I'm going to have a, a drive air balance issue. So I'm going to also take a second and put my back drives in, but not fully deploy them so the airflow doesn't get out of whack. And yeah, if you don't populate your drive bays correctly and obstruct them, the airflow is not going to flow the right way you want it to flow. So we're going to give this a try and see if my monitor will bring it up. Come on. Give me a signal. I don't think it's going to initiate correctly. Yep, it dropped the signal. So give me a second here. I am going to flip it over to my other KVM based monitor and it will do what I want it to do that way. But this will just take me a minute to relocate the chassis to its home. Stand by. Okay. Well, it's over now on the uh, KVM side. Let me see which light will work best. Nope, that's not it. Okay. There we go. Well, let's kill them both. All right, so you probably can't see it very well, unfortunately. I apologize. But if you look, you'll see that it is actually posting. And uh, it's in the process of rebooting. And I will adjust here to make it a little easier on the eyes. Sorry for all the motion. Uh, it's already posted once. I'm going to post again and give it that time to do just that. We're still waiting for it to post. All right, there it goes. All right, so it's coming up now. I have properly rated processors, proper amount of memory, which is good. 104 gigs. My SAS controller interface is doing what it needs to do. It's going to do a control C. Uh, actually, the, the SAS controller is clean, so I don't feel like that's going to be a big headache. Let's just see what it does. It's probably going to scream at me and yell at me and tell me all types of bad things. But the motherboard is clean, which means there is no configuration of disks 
on the onboard SAS controller just what is out there currently. So let's just see how it goes with the post process up to the point where it will clear or it doesn't clear. Let's check. Okay, I'm waiting. Post stat is coming up. I'll give it another minute. This is always such a wonderful joy. Now, a DX720's BIOS has to be configured and set. It will eventually force me to do an F2 or go into the configuration file itself and be able to uh, start the process of discovery, save the values and everything, as well as go through diagnostics uh, and detection, as you're seeing now. This is a clean Dell mo motherboard footprint, not an OEM. So I'm getting all the extended functionalities as well, as well as the uh, baselines that I've been using for a while. So this is actually technically an upgrade uh, from the OEM motherboard that I started with. So we will go ahead and allow it to finish up here on the memory, diagnostics, and identification detection process. Okay, very good. And it's seeing the 10 gig NIC now. Second 10 gig NIC. And it's seeing the bridge Cat 5 and second Cat 5. Very good. So what I'm going to do here is I am comfortable with what I'm seeing here and it is looking good. So my next step is I'll power the system down tonight and I'll prep it for uh, Server 22 installation from Microsoft and um, basically test the water, see how well it does, and then eventually I'll bring in disk configurations as I see fit. Eventually I will rebuild this as my duality storage platform and both the TrueNAS and the Microsoft platform will have a full copy of all of our personal data. Now the beauty of my strategy is nothing's powered up permanently. I always bring things offline, so that really is the ultimate form of uh, defeating hackers. Plus closing the loop locks in environments so that you are not going to be in a situation where you, you know, make yourself vulnerable. Not everybody can do that, and obviously I have to change it to do testing and things like that uh, as I'm doing my work, but normally after I finish the work, I will zero everything out power down systems because I had not made of money and um, you know be frugal it's important to be frugal but it's also cool to think outside the box I hope you guys have fun this is Brad Dyke God bless please have a great week and weekend and uh, more to come take care